Their next session is the telemedicine education and the research. Please welcome the chairperson, Dr. Alir Kikali. Kikali. Alia. <laughs> I'm sorry. Alia. Alia Kikali. And the, he's a lecturer, community medicine department, faculty of the medicine university in Indonesia. And the, the Mr. Mohammed Zahil bin Ahmed. And the, he's the manager of the Information Technology Department, University of the, the Malaya Medical Center. Okay, time is yours. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just a wake up call. <laughs> Just checking. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the great uh, introduction. <clears throat> My name is Arya Kakali. Yeah, I'm from University of Indonesia. And together now with me. My name is Muhammad Zahir bin Ahmad. I'm from UCI of Malaya Medical Center, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Nice to meet you all. Yes. Yes. Uh, it's a great uh, honor for us yeah, to be invited here. And today uh, we will have a, a session entitled Telemedicine Education and research and here we have for distinguished uh, speaker yeah and for the first opportunity uh, we will have uh, mr professor sisira i'm not sure i can pronounce this correctly <laughs> eddie ripulich <laughs> yeah from Uni sisira yeah from university of queensland australia and he will give the <clears throat> presentation entitled and investigating the perceptions of health workforce regarding the digital health training. Yes. Hope you're ready. <clears throat> okay. Please proceed, Mr. Sisera. Okay. Technology. Um, yes, uh, and thank you very much for inviting. Uh, this is my first visit, and I get to get to know a lot of people, a lot of interesting uh, researchers and uh, people, those who are contributing to this field. It's a, it's a great honor to be here today. Um, so, um, title of my uh, work is Digital Health Education and Training for Health Workforce and Australian Experience. Um, uh, this is the presentation that I'm doing first time in, in my life. Normally I go to conferences, present some research that I have done uh, with the uh, results showing what I have found. In this work, I am going to talk about a 20-year or a 20-year-long journey, particularly a personal journey, journey of our center. Uh, in fact, digital health uh, education-related journey of Australia in a very brief 10-15 uh, minutes work. So. Um, this is the outline. I will be talking about a number of research work that we have done uh, over the years to show what's really happening in the field of education and training in digital health and also what the evolution has been like. So the I'm not going to talk too much about the importance of digital health because today, from the very early presentation, we have been talking about all sorts of examples, how technology is impacting uh, the area of, or the field of uh, healthcare, field of medicine. There have been a number of different examples, how 
clinicians are using uh, technology to enhance patient care. So digital health is real. Digital health is here. It's, uh, it's not a fantasy anymore. All the uh, clinicians, health workers have no choice not to use technology. In one way or another, uh, doctors have to use technology. They are enforced to do or uh, 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 sort of they, 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 have, they are obliged to use technology uh, for communication, for diagnosis, for treatment, for follow-ups. So uh, doctors are using. And in terms of uh, digital technologies or digital health, there have been at least 50 years of research uh, evidence to show that if you use technology uh, uh, correctly, uh, it is beneficial to patients, clinicians, and the healthcare system. It is cost-effective. There are a number of research have established the uh, cost-beneficial uh, analysis. They have done the analysis and established the use of uh, uh, digital health. And the government's health systems are supporting the use of technology, and they are, in, in fact, emphasizing the doctors to use, encourage doctors to use technology in their day-to-day -day practice. Technology uh, point of view, technology is getting more advanced every time. Technology is getting user-friendly, so that's an incentive for doctors to use technology. In, in their clinical practice. After all these things, after all these evidence, we still talk about how to get doctors to use technology. We are still puzzling why we are not able to get doctors to use technology, why digital health is not being integrated seamlessly into the clinical practice. One answer to this question that I always believe is the education and training. Because over the last 40, 50 years, we have been doing all sorts of research to understand how technology is beneficial in healthcare systems, delivery of healthcare, and so on and so forth. But we never tried properly to educate the users of digital health to use them properly. We did not properly integrated education and training into the uh, clinical practice or clinicians. So this was the journey of, uh, so when I started working at the uh, uh, University of Queensland in the Center for Online Health 20 years ago, I was given uh, the role of director in education in digital health. So as a director, I had to design the courses, teach the courses, coordinate the courses. I was the only man to do everything. That is 20 years ago, where all the digital health research is happening at the background. Center for Online Health had a vision that we need to teach uh, uh, medical students, we need to teach nurses digital health, otherwise it will never happen. But we were teaching very limited number of courses those days. So when I was offering these courses, I was intrigued and interested in understanding what the practitioners are thinking about digital health. So I started looking into the perceptions relating to digital health from different perspectives. So I did some work in terms of nurses, I uh, started asking medical students, what do you think about digital health? What is it? Is it uh, uh, beneficial to you? Do you think it will be uh, uh, used in your future practice? Are you interested in learning about digital health? That type of very basic needs analysis type work. So I have been doing all kinds of uh, perceptional uh, expectation related research. 
And then I started developing some curriculum uh, with the understanding of people's uh, 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 medical students and other uh, health workforce uh, perceptions. I started developing different components in the uh, uh, as educational uh, material. So this is uh, one work that we published. We uh, created the hands-on practical session in relation to e-health and integrated into the e-health program. So um, students, uh, so we assess the students' uh, knowledge, uh, evaluated the knowledge. We also look at the perceptions and satisfaction of students. So uh, another thing the, uh, I did was also, this is over the years from 2004, over the years until now, I have been, these are the series of number of publications that I'm taking as examples. So this was um, somewhere in, uh, this is 2018, I published, I went back to the students, those who studied our digital health, and I wanted to understand, are they using these knowledges and skills they have uh, learned in the courses in their practice. So certainly there was a very positive uh, uh, positive result that we I can found that some students, those who uh, have been learning digital health, telehealth, telemedicine, are now working in Queensland Health or Health Ministry or teaching uh, as an academic. So this was uh, that type of uh, work that I have done and published in the literature again and also i want to understand what is in the in the literature in terms of education and training did a literature review and we found very little globally looking into the research relating to uh, um, education and training in telemedicine telehealth digital health in this uh, review article education and training to support uh, use of clinical telehealth, we only found nine studies globally. And also, we did another work um, to understand how education and, uh, education and training is uh, set up in the area of EMR, EHR, electronic medical records. So it, it is very important to understand the global evidence, evidence or research around that area um, globally published uh, 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 results. And this is an interesting work that I also uh, did in 2018 again, quite recently, I would say, in, in, the ter in terms of the long, uh, long span of time. What I did was, so after all these efforts, we, we were not able to teach digital health into medical, medical students. We couldn't integrate medical, uh, uh, digital health into medical curriculums. So after such a frustration, what I did was I interviewed all the deans in the medical schools in Australia, all the medical faculties, dean and a major educator, educational director, medical curriculum. So two people in each medical school in all Australia and I ask, okay, now the digital health is coming. Are you, do you think it is important? Everybody overwhelmingly said digital health, e-health is important. Are you teaching your, your students, medical, future medical practitioners, your medical students, do you teach uh, uh, medi uh, digital health to your medical students? No. It is so. I titled the uh, the article. It is important, but not important enough to teach in the medical school because priority was not that. So, um, so this was another uh, uh, sort of uh, under to understand what what was really happening over the years, and then COVID happened, and during the COVID, of course. 
whole Australian medical school started to think about what is this technology? Technology is, is available, why shouldn't we uh, use it? And Australian Medical Council immediately took up the initiative and they started exploring the opportunity for um, integrating digital health education into medical schools. So they had a capability framework, they developed a cap capability framework, they um, invited uh, the experts, they looked at the uh, literature published over the years, and I'm, I'm very proud to, proud to say some of the publications that we published over the years were also referred uh, in, their, um, uh, in their work. So the, eventually, Australian Medical Council recommended, they, they uh, mandated all the medical schools need to have digital health in their medical curriculum as an essential component. That was a great breakthrough. Uh, and also Australian Digital Health Agency, which is the uh, major national agency on digital health, they came aboard and they were very keen to uh, uh, develop workforce in terms of digital health. So those two forces were very, very powerful in terms of getting digital health education on board. And then certainly the academic institutions, including our uh, University of Queensland, uh, if you look at all the universities and medical schools across Australia, now you can see that all the medical schools are now working uh, concertedly to incorporate digital health into uh, their medical curriculums. So I, I think um, I'm not running out of time or I'm in time going over what is, what's, what's the situation over there. But in the uh, in conclusion, what I wanted to say is that we can't underestimate the importance of education and training. And I'm so glad that this conference has put a, such, a, such an emphasis on education and training. And there's a lot of work behind the scene happening in uh, Kuriko Sensei's initiative is great in order to get this workforce development uh, in terms of clinicians as well as those who are supporting and essentially doing uh, the, the, the core work as techni technical support techni technicians, getting them, uh, 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 getting them the required skills. So looking into re uh, research is very important in order to build evidence. Uh, so by doing that, of course, we can develop appropriate teaching uh, content and find the right methods to deliver. So, um, Essentially, education and training must be given priority. That's my take home message. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Sizira. Uh, it's uh, very essential to us to know that uh, there is a journey for you to introduce and to raise the awareness of the Australian universities about the importance about the digital health education and training in the medical students. So that I invite the questions from the audience. Thank you. Uh, yes, we have two. <clears throat> Could you go ladies first? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Shishira, thank you very much for coming here and give us uh, your uh, experience. And uh, yeah, really uh, wonderful you were the ex ex uh, a pioneer for the education in telemedicine. And also wonderful is uh, all of your yeah, present today, your first author. And <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, there's very nice uh, researches. And uh, I just uh, curious, uh, one of your uh, researches, uh, which is the uh, uh, you make the interviews for all Australian university deans and the uh, published the paper. And I imagine that we, if we do same thing in Japan, uh, maybe it's a little bit difficult because uh, yeah, dean's voice uh, is published <laughs> uh, and uh, compared to other uh, 
multiple institutions. So do you have any uh, difficulties or do you, um, why did, did you um, do, did you able to do this kind of a wonderful, yeah, uh, yeah, like, yeah, research? Thank you, thank you, Kuriko. Yes, I mean, great uh, uh, question. The rationale for choosing those two people, deans of the faculties are the policymakers in terms of making decisions what to what to teach and how to teach all these sort of things. The, the, the higher level decisions are made by the dean and the education director, director of medical education is the one who is looking after the curriculum. So I thought those two people are very important. And then once we decided, after deciding uh, the, uh, uh, the participants, it was really a big challenge to approach them. So I, um, I certainly uh, approached those who are approachable, you know, directly, however, based that I can approach them. And those who are not approachable, I approach them so at the side, you know, I, I I sort of contacted somebody who closely know him and asked him, you know, we are doing this research. Can you please help us? So the basically colleagues and friends of those people, but everyone was very supportive in some cases. And I my interviews were only five minutes. I was asking very key questions, and they were quickly they 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 agreed. Oh, five minutes, that's fine, you know. Um, but when I started talking about these things, you know, some some people took half an hour talking about, you know, wow, our medical students, they should know these things, you know, this is coming and all this. So they were very supportive of it. Yeah, so um, um, of course, it's not a comparison, you know, Australia has 25 medical schools and Japan, how many hundreds of, uh, I think. So it is not a comparator, but certainly I think this is a, national study which uh, which gives some sense of a uh, sort of a good evidence to show that you know getting them on board is very important to um, sort of uh, getting something going okay thank you very much yeah the passion is very important and yeah <laughs> yeah great work congrats thank you and mr satya please <clears throat> Yeah, a very informative talk, uh, Professor Chistra. Thank you. So I have one question. Uh, this, what are the bottleneck areas you see in training uh, the uh, paramedical or medical staff in this digital health system? Because we all started the conventional hospitals. Now, with the time, we are supposed to change, and we are just changing it to towards digital health. So we generally feel it's it's difficult to uh, make people understand the importance of the digital health. So what are the bottleneck areas you see and how we can attend those issues? Okay. Yeah. So what, what you are asking is the content that we are delivering to students. Is that correct? Yeah. The curriculum. Yes. Okay. So um, uh, the course for the particularly medical school. So we teach certainly uh, into medical curriculum. The curriculum of speech pathology and uh, physiotherapy, that type of things, you know, the therapy students, allied health, nursing. So if I talk about the uh, medical school, medical students, our course is called uh, Introduction to Digital Health. So it's a very elementary uh, one semester, three months. We have two semesters, one semester long course that students uh, take this course for getting a basic understanding of the uh, the area of digital health. We start with the terminologies because there's a very convoluted, very confusing uh, uh, terminologies around digital health, e-health, telehealth, informatics, and so on and so forth. But we just try to clarify that and then move on to telehealth. How to, and we do also have practical sessions uh, for a, a medical, personal to do a proper uh, uh, telehealth consultations using using video uh, consultation, you know? So that type of uh, practical sessions and how to use EMR, EHR. Yes. So that, those are key uh, hands-on type of things. And apart from that, mHealth, uh, clinical decision-making, data crunching, and uh, all sorts of things, not in a very uh, deep way, but in a, 
you know, substantial way so that they can understand uh, what's the relevance of those aspects in their future practice. You fix certain time uh, period for these yeah. Uh, people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this this is a, a semester based course. Okay. Certainly, they do have um, certain times and timetable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank you Prof. Very much. Thank yeah. you. Very important and inspiring us to copy your uh, the way that you teach the medical students. Yeah, in the other country. And next, we'll introduce by my co-chair, uh, Mr. Zahir. Okay, uh, for the second speaker for today, for this session, uh, we will have uh, Associate Professor Toru Oga. He's a, a department from Department of Political Science, Faculty of Law, Yushu University Hospital, Japan. And this topic will be Policy Analysis of Telemedicine, Addressing Global mm -hmm. Health Disparities and Emerging Hi. Framework in Developmental uh, Aids. Hi. Hi. Ah, nice, nice. Okay, Professor, uh, yeah. you may start yeah, yes. when you're ready. Okay, um, thank you, Chairperson, for yeah, nice introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Thor Oga. Um, yeah, um, actually, I'm not medical guys, and I'm doing the social science and international relations. And many years, um, I do the policy studies. So today, uh, the my approach is the linking in the telemedicine and the international cooperation and the partnership, uh, and the development, uh, yeah, uh, development aid. So. I think that many people believe that telemedicine can reduce the medical disparities, but question is how. And also, uh, yeah, I saw some some morning sessions, and many people said that networking and partnership is uh, important. So the, maybe this is the triangular relations. The cooperation promotes the telemedicine, and also telemedicine reduces the medical disparities. So today, the I'm going to talk about that those triangular relations among development aid, the telemedicine and the medical disparities. Okay, the outlines here, the first way, um, I, yeah, I'm gonna introduce the medical disparities and also uh, I overview the development aid. And finally, uh, I have some, the case studies, the how the development aid and the, how the international partnership uh, will promote the telemedicine practice. Okay. Um, let me start with the simple questions. So, what do you think the which has more serious impact to access the healthcare our uh, healthcare service? The we have two choices. The first way, um, in the people living in the poverty area and people living in the highest economic gap countries. Yeah, it is. It is some difficult questions. The in other words, the question is like this. The which situation is more serious to access the healthcare service, the people living in Africa or the people uh, living in the slums in the New York City? So um, actually there are many indicators and they're somewhat difficult to compare. Um, for example, um, yeah, uh, here is the change, uh, sorry, the change in the cancer deaths. So the cancer deaths, they declined the both the rich country and the poor countries, but declining rate is uh, different. So the those, the dark blue and light blue is a poor, poor countries and the red and orange uh, is a rich countries. So uh, through the 40 years, the in 1970s and the 2010s, the Cancer deaths is drastically declined uh, in the rich countries, and uh, also poor country is declined, but um, decline rate is a difference. So this is a simple measures. Uh, yeah, this is a simple measures. The economic gap uh, exists uh, in the rich country and the poor country, and also it's incorporate the those the cancer deaths, but also those economic gap also exists the inside of the countries. So. 
the, this is a different measure, the Gini index and the life expectancy rate. So the Gini index uh, means the high, higher Gini index means the higher inequality in the countries. So Brazil is higher Gini index. So life expectancy is the middle of the 70s. But uh, if we see the United States in the middle of the chart, so the it is the middle of the Gini index and life expectancy is the around 79. And if we see the Sweden, the, yeah, the Gini index is very low and very equal countries and life expectancy is the over, 80, over 83. And in the different angles uh, of the inequality inside of the countries, that this is in, the comparing the inequality and the heart failure rate. So in the country in red, the highest inequality such as the South America and the China. And those country is heart failure rate is the more than 13. And in, yeah, uh, in the intermediate countries, the like United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom and Spain. So the those the intermediate countries, the heart failure rate is the around eleven, and the lowest inequality countries, the such as the Japan and the yeah, most of the EU countries. So heart failure rate is yeah um, rather degrees the around ten. Yeah, um, the final graph is the. This is yeah, this graph focus on the poor health conditions and difference between lower education people and higher education people. And uh, have a look on the left side, the Malta and Ireland and Norway. That the, yeah, um, the gap between lower education and higher education is the very little. But if we see the right part of the graph, that we have Latvia, United States, and Portugal. So the, we have the highest gap there between the lower education people and higher education people. So back to the original question. So the which situation is more serious in the poverty and uh, in the economic gap? The, this is very difficult question and the difficult comparisons. So the actually this is the yeah still ongoing debate between the poverty versus the economic economic gap debate, but um, we have the different mechanism and the different the reasoning. For example, in the impact of the properties, the poverty creates the direct economic barriers that people access to the medical service. But on the other hand, the impact on the economic gap, so maybe the in the country with the economic gap, the, they have the at least the, yeah, some extent of the medical services, but those distribution of medical resources is the uneven and unequal. So in yeah, in the countries on the poverty and the countries on the economic gap, that they have the different context and the different mechanisms. But uh, in both in the both situations, the people are difficult to access uh in the healthcare service. Then the question is the how the telemedicine can solve the those situations the Theoretically, so in the addressing the properties, the telemedicine may, yeah, may saving uh, in the trans transportation costs uh, and the time for the peoples, but uh, also that we need minimum, yeah, minimum standard of the infrastructure and also the the minimum standard of the technology for the telemedicines. On the other hand, the in the countries the addressing the economic gap, so. Telemedicine can help alleviate inequality in the medical resources uh, between the, those regions and between those areas, but also it also constrains the availability of the technologies. So maybe those the available, unavailable, and the different different distribution of the technologies can help by international partnership and international cooperations. So why the international cooperation and the partnership are the necessary? So there are several reasons. So for example, that we can uh, we can share the technology and knowledge, and also we have the policy formulation among different countries, and also we can funding and the resources that are for the telemedicine facilities or something. And also uh, through the international cooperation, and 
we can enhance the education uh, and the training. Uh, maybe the uh, other speakers explain those education and the training stuff. Okay, then um, let me quickly overview the development age. So historically, we have three development of the development age. The first one is financial assistance. That this is directly funding those the developing countries. And the second way is technical assistance that those the transfer the technology that those the developing countries and finally the this trend is started in yeah I, I think from 1990s so that this is a participatory approach the it is the the more communi communicative approach uh, with the stakeholders the planning and implementation of project and also it emphasizes involvement and the feedback the, from stakeholders and the local communities yeah, uh, from the local community and the stakeholders. Okay, so the, what is the current stage of the telemedicine uh, in the development aid? So firstly, on the financial assistance, so the fund from the yeah uh, global entity support and the telemedicine technology and infrastructure and development. So the, we, yeah, we need the much fund the, for the infrastructure development. And also uh, in the technical assistance. So actually, the, this is the hard, uh, hard technology and also the soft technology and the human resources and expertise from developed countries the, to guide telemedicine platform, the designing healthcare workers and the training. And finally, the participatory assistance. So local community involvement in the telemedicine project ensure alignment with the regional the healthcare need. Then the actually on the development age that we have the many different stakeholders and many different stakeholders that need to cooperate each other. So uh, especially the four stakeholders are important, the international organization and the states, yeah, I mean the government and the business and the non-profit sectors. Firstly, on the international organizations. So uh, yeah, the more famous and more uh, biggest organization is the World Health Organization. So that they enhance the, the global telemedicine service and also create the guideline and the best best practice, best practice, also the data analysis and the guidance. Um, the other organization is the international development agencies such as the World Bank and ADB and support the telemedicine in the developing countries. So they launch the many development projects uh, for the telemedicine and the targeting to the developing countries. Also, uh, we have the some, uh, some states uh, emphasizing in the telemedicine practice, the, such as the United States, United Kingdom, the Norway, and the Switzerland. The, so those, those countries are also launch the development project uh, to the ter to telemedicine in the developing countries. And especially, uh, I. Yeah, I just introduced the in the case of Japan. So the JICA, Japan International Corporate Agency, that provides the ODA, Official Development Assistance for telemedicine in the developing countries. So the, this uh, this picture is the JICA uh, supporting the ICU care uh, in the developing nations. So the those care uh, covered the many countries, the including the Bangladesh, Indonesia, Tonga, and yeah, and Kenya and Senegal uh, and blah blah blah. So um, actually, the many many states, especially the many OECD countries, that launch the those the telemedicine project, and uh, maybe this is the difficult to see. The um, in the right bar is the countries the launch the yeah launch the project to study the telemedicines and. The dark blue is a countries the starting studies of telemedicine and including Australia and Japan and the other OECD countries. And the middle bar is the countries the starting to research uh, measurement of the telemedicines. So uh, actually in the middle bar, uh, Japan is excluded, the, which means that Japan has not yet studied those measurement of the telemedicines. And the finally the Light bar. Uh, it is only the nine country is including. So that this means that those those countries are uh, 
already have established the indicators and the metrics uh, of the telemedicines. Okay. And also the uh we uh maybe I think the one or two minutes left. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> also the we have the the business sectors and technology provisions, and also that they have a partnership with the developing country. And also we have the non-profit sectors. So non-profit sectors, they especially uh, strengthen uh, is the, those partnerships with, with the local community and awareness uh, and education. So in a conclusion, so actually that we have the some challenge on the, especially for the social science research, that this is the data availability, the, which means the different countries have different contexts and the different measurement on the telemedicine. So it is somewhat difficult uh, to for the international comparison. So data availability uh, is the uh, one of the difficulties. And also we have technological disparity and also the regulatory and the policy issues is different. So maybe the Actually, the uh, policy framework is different, and also uh, social economic condition is different. But uh, finally, needless to say that we have the opportunity and significance that we can improve the healthcare access and a core effective solution. And also through the telemedicine, that we can uh, enhance the capacity building and the global health equalities. So, uh, yeah, that's for that's all for my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Joe Aga, for the interesting presentation to know about uh, this uh, policies analysis. Uh, is there any questions or comment from the floor? Okay, Dr. Jeffrey. Professor, uh, Dr. Domino, nice to meet you in person now. Um, very good uh, presentation uh, analysis with regards to how the inequalities have been shown you know, in different countries. And I do agree with the conclusion and your framework as well. Um, my only question is, um, there was nothing mentioned about government policies. And we know that uh, if there's a, really a support from the government, there is, but I wanted to ask, um, was there a study on this with regards to how each of these government, comparing the different countries, the one with less inequality compared to the ones, because um, so far it was more the economic gaps, but how about government support? Was there, is there any um, a very big influence with that? What the, I don't know, with your analysis. Uh, yeah. Um, I, yeah, um, in this presentation, I don't include the, those kind of government policies, but um, WHO uh, published the, yeah, I think the GOEs, the Global Observatory on eHealth, and the GOEs, they also include the, the each government, the national policy on the eHealth, so yeah, yeah, maybe the yeah, I'm going to analyze the those kind the different the comparative government policies on e health. Yeah. Okay, uh because of time, I think that's uh, the yeah. only question that we can allow in the session. So please big uh please give big applause to uh Professor Sofu Olga for the interesting presentation. Now I pass to uh my co-chair to introduce the third speaker. Yeah. The next speaker, I don't think he need no more introductions. <laughs> we know him already. Uh, the Sintaro Ueda, yeah, our trainer <clears throat> of the <clears throat> training uh, program at Tamdek. Mr. Sintaro Ueda is an engineer and also part of the training in the telemedicine engineering tra uh, training at Tamdek. And yeah, the time is yours, uh, Mr. Sintaro Ueda. Okay, thank you very much for your introduction. I'm Shintaro Ueda at Kyushu University Hospital, Autonomous and Development Center of Asia, Tendak. I, I never think. Okay, and I, I will talk about um, Thomas and engineering training we at Tendak carry out for overseas um, engineers. And the program I will talk about today is Sakura Science Exchange Program. This is supported by JST, um, Japan Science Technology Agency. Okay, an outline of this program. Okay, it, I think you all know that it's crucial to create and maintain a network of skilled telemedicine engineers to establish continuous international telemedicine activities that we all carry out. 
So with this in mind, we carried out our online program in 2021 and an on-site program in 2023. In the online program, we gathered engineers from Asia to discuss what the um, the issues are in telemedicine activities and what the solutions may be to solve them. And we gathered around again after a couple of months to see if the engineers were able to imp implement the solutions that were discussed. And in, on the on-site program, uh, we focused on hands-on training for telemedicine engineers, how to set up live demonstrations, um, how to set up hybrid conference rooms. And we gave demonstrations of new technologies. The engineers that came to the Sakura Science Program were from three from Vietnam to Bhutan, one each from Indonesia, Nepal, India, and Malaysia. So six countries, nine engineers. So here's the schedule of the program. It was a total of nine days if you include the arrival and departure date. Um, orientation on the se second, um, hands-on on the third, sixth, seventh, and eighth and culture study on the fourth and fifth. Okay, uh, first thing that happened is the engineers arrived to Fukuoka airport and Shinta and Miho um, greeted them and took them to their hotel. And that's it for the um, February 1st. And next is orientation carried out on February 2nd. Um, orientation is always the first thing that we always do is at Temdek. And Kuriko gave an orientation um, introducing the objective and schedule of the training. Okay, on the third, um, the engineers were taught the, how to set up a hybrid conference room. First, the lecture was given by Yoshiko and the engineers moved to the actual venue and they started to set up um, according to the equipment diagram. And the equipment diagram is shown here. And for um, some of you that haven't seen an equipment diagram, it's made of um, connections of image, audio, and network equipment. And let me just um, quickly explain this diagram, not in detail, but just quickly. Um, first, there's three laptops that were used. One is for the input and output of audio and visual to, to and from Zoom. And one is for the sharing presentation from Zoom PC. And one is for sending the presentation data to the Zoom PC. And for the audio, um, two wireless, wireless microphones were used and a portable speakerphone was used and it was connected to Zoom PC via audio interface. And for the image, a PTZ camera and a projector to a screen was used from the Zoom PC. This is a quick explanation of the um, equipment diagram. Okay, then the engineers set up um, and Obviously, we focused on, on the hands-on. So the engineers experienced that it's different from actually in, um, understanding the equipment diagram in their head and actually using their hands to set up. So this was a very um, important experience for the engineers. And fourth, fifth, they had a culture study in Hiroshima and they rode the bullet train Shinkansen to Hiroshima. And um, after arriving to Hiroshima, the first thing they uh, received was a special lecture from uh, Professor Yoko, Yoko Shinpuku from Hiroshima University uh, on fetal ultrasound education for midwives using information communication technology in Tanzania. And they learned the challenges and success of educating with the use of minimal equipment. 
Okay, after some sightseeing, um, the engineers um, experience a different kind of hands-on. They made their own okonomiyaki, uh, Japanese cuisine. Okay, after coming back to Temdek on the 6th, they experienced live endoscopy demonstration using 360 camera and virtual reality. And for most of them, it was their first time to use um, virtual reality and 360 degree camera. Yukiko um, gave them a lecture in the morning and in the afternoon, before going to the endoscopy room, um, she introduced them what equipment they will use. Here's the 360 camera, the head mount display, and audio equipment. And here's the another equipment diagram. I won't um, explain much. It's just that um, to watch the live demonstration, a head mount display was used and also a laptop with a uh, specific um, software was used. And here's a screenshot of the laptop. And this image right here is actually a 360 degree um, image that you can move around using the mouse cursor. And here's another 360 degree um, image of the endoscopy room that we use. And the engineers um, learned the basics of live endoscopy demonstration and some tips on how to use the 360 camera and virtual reality. And the next day on the 7th, um, they were explained um, using a video sharing platform called JoinView. Um, Nagayoshi Sensei mentioned this. Um, in her presentation. And after the explanation, we had an active discussion on how to use this in an educational program. And I, I really enjoy the um, discussion. And in the afternoon of the 7th, um, Nopa from Indonesia gave the 33rd Indonesian Neu Neurology Teleconference from Pendek. He always, he's the chief engineer of this program and he always controls from the Indonesian, Indonesian side, but it was his first time to control from the Japanese side. And he was able to meet um, Professor Isobe, um, the leading doctor of this program. And the eighth um, is training report conference. Um, at Temdek, we always have the engineers carry out this conference. And um, there's two objectives. One is to set up the room that they will actually use, and two, to make a presentation on what they learn and what they will take back home. And they connected their own institutions with other um, Asian institutions. And everyone finished their training report conference successfully and received certificates, and that any that it ends the training okay, and my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for a very <clears throat> interesting uh, presentation. And we also see not only technical, but also master chef yeah, there. <laughs> okay. Uh, so is there any questions from the audience? <clears throat> So uh, I want to ask you a question about, uh, do you also assess uh, what happened after the training? Maybe when they come back again to their institution uh, about the the impact of that training. Mm -hmm. Is there any assessment after that? Uh, one evaluation we carry out is um, we compare before the training and after the training about the confidence on certain um, criteria. Um, it's better, they have more confidence after the training. Okay, or any, <clears throat> and you also introduced a new uh, approach here like 360 mm -hmm. and the others. Is there any real implementation after that in there or any report? Um, no, 
unfortunately, um, nothing from the international side. Okay. Any? Oh. Oh, yeah. Min San from the audience. <clears throat> from the. Uh, Min San, you can raise your questions. Hi, uh, Suta, uh, Shitaro. Hello, Min San. Uh, <laughs> Uh, presentation. Um, I see. I I I can see. Uh, yeah, the program is very useful for the uh engineer, especially the uh, uh new engineer. And um, but uh, I think uh, uh, is the um, I have an idea if uh, the uh, content of the program, I mean the uh presentation file or the um, uh program. Uh, if uh, you can uh, up to upload to the uh, website, or you can you can uh, input it the in the um, program uh, uh, on template website, so um, we can uh, 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 send it to the engineer uh, who cannot uh, uh, have chance to uh, attend the program. So uh, after that. Um, uh, new uh, engineer can accept and download or see the program. I think it's very useful for them uh, anytime they uh, need uh, to uh, uh, to know uh, to learn uh, knowledge about telemedicine. Okay, um, I don't think I got the question. Correctly. Yeah, I think he 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 mean that is it. Uh... <clears throat> The material, the guideline of your your uh, training, is it available in the website or in the uh, public okay. place that we uh, the next? Uh... Uh, yeah. So yeah. for those that cannot come to Japan and train, um, yep. actually, um, Kuriko has a four year project, um, trying to make online training. Yeah. Um, please look forward to that. <laughs> Yes, Minsan. Uh, yeah, we have uh, <clears throat> the next uh, project is to develop the online the training uh, materials, and I think we will inform you about that. The 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 progress. Yeah, it's yeah. still under constructions. Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Thank ah, you. Prof. Kuriko will add something about that. <clears throat> Uh, so uh, it's not a question and uh, just a comment to audience and participants. So we are, uh, Temdek is having this kind of engineering training, inviting international uh, engineers. And uh, uh, we have some, uh, our Japanese government uh, provides some uh, grant for uh, this kind of activity. So we are very happy to uh, um, send the proposal so uh, if you have any candidate or if you have any plan, please uh, discuss with us. And uh, yeah, let's create some new uh, plan. So yeah, that's all my comment. Thank you very much for an ask. Thank Thanks. you very much. So that's closing our uh, this presentation. Applause to Dr. Sindaro Ueda. <laughs> And we will look forward for the progress of the telemedicine uh, training program. And then uh, the last speaker, uh, Mr. Zahir, will introduce. Okay, uh, I would like to introduce the last speaker for today, for the last topic. Uh, she's a professor, Dr. Arunima Chowdhury. Uh, she's a professor from the uh, Department of Physiology. Uh, from Budawan Medical College and Hospital, India. So her topic will be about quite interesting, which is uh, ethics, introduction, and conceptual framework. Okay, uh, Professor, you may start when you're ready. Am I audible? And is my screen visible? Yes. Hello? Yes. Hello, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes. So this symposium is about a world without medical disparities. And so I will be introducing ethics, introduction, and conceptual framework. You can see in this picture, there was assault on doctors, so they went into strike. In your opinion, is the strike justified? Is it professional and ethical for doctors to go on strike? What will be the consequences? Clinical practice consists of knowledge, 
ethics and skills. Knowledge without skill is incompetent. Knowledge and skill without ethics is unscrupulous. Our commitment, we do not just treat, but we care. We do not just care, but we strive to improve the quality of care. The objectives of this session, define ethics and its significance in health professions education, identify and explain major ethical theories and frameworks, apply ethical principles to hypothetical scenarios in the professional context. Legal, ethical, and moral, legal, what the society accepts as bad or good. Ethical, what a body of professional accepts as desirable acts. Moral, what an individual decides for oneself based on personal family system. This is picture of Dr. Savita. She was an Indian origin dentist from Ireland. In 2012, she came to the hospital. She was 17 weeks pregnant and she complained of some bellow back pain. And there was this, she was discharged without a diagnosis. She returned later that day, complaining of low pressure and sensation of something coming down her vagina. On examination, the gestational sac was found protruding. She was admitted to the hospital, but had an incomplete abortion. She requested for medical termination of pregnancy, but it was not legal at that time in Ireland if a fetal heartbeat was present. She died of sepsis on the next day. Traditional ethical theory, rule of reciprocity. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you reflects concern for others. Ethical sensitivity leads to professional commitment. Practice ethics are aspirational goals based on universal principles, non-maleficence, that is, do no harm, beneficence, do good, justice, fairness and equality, patient autonomy, freedom of choice. Principles can overlap as well as compete with each other for priority. Let's see some examples. Beneficence versus non-maleficence. Risky surgery. A complex heart operation. Autonomy versus beneficence. Treating one who has attempted suicide. Justice versus autonomy. One child norm in China. Ban of fetal gender testing in India. Ethics and action concept. Ethics, standard of conduct derived from principles of right and wrong. We must be able to distinguish right from wrong, good from evil, and priority from impriority. At times, this may be difficult. We must commit ourselves to do what is right, good, and proper. Ethics is therefore an action concept and not simply an idea to argue about. So these are the four pillars of medical ethics, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence and justice, ethical theories and major ethical philosophers, the role of theory, the worldview, how to understand it and how to change. Descriptive theory, the ease. Ethical theory, the ought, and how to change it, the action. Now we come to utilitarianism. This theory prescribes actions that maximize happiness and well-being for all affected individuals. What yields benefit to maximum numbers? Therefore, in a shrinking ship, it is ethical to let some people drown to save the life of others. Most triage protocols are utilitarian. In that, they seek to maximize the lives saved. COVID-19 promoted hospitals, healthcare systems, and government to develop crisis standards of care, including these protocols, to potentially ration medical supplies. Pandemic highlighted and exacerbated racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic health disparities. Now when we come to duty ethics, 
In contrast to consequentialism theories like the utilitarianism, it is that an action is moral if it conforms to certain principles or duties, irrespective of the consequences. In a shipwreck and trials examples, killing someone or letting someone die is the utility theory. The universal rule in ethics is do no harm. So it is ethically wrong to let someone die in duty ethics. Now we come to virtue ethics. Morality depends on perfecting one's character, emphasizes on virtues of the individual, concerned with the person or agent behind the actions, not the actions themselves, emotions, attitudes, habits, lifestyles considered morally relevant. The way you are, not what you do, can be classified as the good or bad. It argues that life is too complex to be guided by strict rules that dictate how we should act. It is holistic. It examines the purpose of life rather than individual moments. Now, the utilitarianism is consequences. It is a concept introduced by Bentham, greatest happiness principle. Duty ethics, that is conformity to moral principles introduced by Kant, categorical imperative. Virtue ethics perfects one's character, Aristotle, tenuous. Now, the principle of ethics introduced by the ICMR, that is Indian Council of Medical Research, in 2017. Principles of essentiality, principles of voluntariness, principles of non-exploitation, principle of social responsibility, principle of ensuring privacy and confidentiality, principle of risk minimization, principle of professional competence, principle of maximization of benefit, institutional arrangements, principle of transparency and accountability, principle of Totality of responsibility, principle of environmental protection. This is picture of Aruna Shanba. In 1973, she was sexually assaulted by a young ward boy. Remained in a vegetative state for 41 years. In 1980s, BMC made two attempts to move her to Kenyan Feedback. Plan was abandoned on protest by nurses. Now, activist, journalist Pinky, she filed a case for euthanasia in the Supreme Court. KM staff wished that Aruna should leave. Should a person in a persistent vegetative state be allowed to die? Should it be active euthanasia or passive? Who will decide? What are the ethical principles that apply to this situation? So utility theory versus duty theory. Hospital has other patients to care and cannot spend so much resources on one person. Whereas the hospital staff are committed to care for the person, beneficence and non-beneficence, patient autonomy, maximization of benefits, that is resources, the court's decision, Allow passive euthanasia in specific circumstances, reflecting a recognition of the right to die with dignity. Decision to be taken by parents, spouse, close relatives, or next friends. Petitioner was not considered as next friend. So here we can see the principles of essentiality, principles of voluntariness, principles of non-exploitation, Principle of social responsibility, principle of maximization of benefits, principles of institutional arrangements. Now, let us see another case. Mr. T, a 35-year-old married man, he had unprotected sex with prostitute and was found to be HIV positive. His physician offers to meet with Mr. T and his wife to assist and disclosure of this information. But Mr. T doesn't want his wife to know about his condition. Should the autonomy of the person be respected? What about the wife? Does she not have the right to know about this disease? 
what are the ethical principles that apply to the situation? So there is some principle of social responsibility. And there is a conflict between confidentiality and ensuring privacy of the patient. But there is also a principle of risk minimization for the wife. So the, all these need to be considered when taking a decision for this patient. For an ethical, from an ethical perspective, the COVID-19 pandemic is like a prison. Top ethics concern were grouped around five moral and social core values, that is autonomy, privacy, equity, proportionality, and trust, principles of environmental protection. That was the lockdown. Vaccination, COVID-19 pandemic. The right to accept vaccine or not. Individual right versus larger public good. Principles of essentiality, principles of voluntariness, principles of non-exploitation, principle of social responsibility, principle of risk minimization, benefit maximization, and institutional arrangement. All these needs to be considered. Now we come to another case. A 12-year-old boy had cataract surgery at a large teaching hospital. At a critical moment, the surgeon's hand slips, rupturing the lens capsule. The plan implementation of the intraocular lens has to be abandoned. Instead, the patient will have to use contact lens. So what should the physician do? And what he has to divulge to the community? What will be the consequence of telling the truth? And what is the solution for this problem? There should be principle of transparency and accountability and principle of total responsibility and professional competence and maximization of benefits also need to be considered. Then professional responsibility, commitment to professional competence, commitment to honesty with patient, commitment to patient confidentiality, commitment to maintaining appropriate relations with patient, commitment to improving of quality of care, commitment to improving access to care, commitment to a just distribution of finite resources, commitment to scientific knowledge, commitment to maintaining trust by managing conflicts of interest, commitment to professional responsibilities. Four core professionalism principles, that is patient care-centered care, integrity and accountability, fair and ethical stewardship of resources, and pursuit for excellence. So we do not just treat, but we care. And we do not just care, but we strive to improve the quality of care. Thank you from Bhagwat Medical College. Thank you, Professor Abud Anu Dima, for the wonderful presentation. Is there any? Thank you, sir. Is there any comments or questions to Professor Arunima? Okay, uh, probably I have one question to Professor. Uh, yes, sir. Is, uh, is there any uh, example or case uh, for this uh, violation of ethics uh, for telemedicine uh, activity that you can think of? Maybe some other example. Sir, patient autonomy can be violated and principles of justice, that is equal distribution. We we are now provide in our college telemedicine services use for giving patient care to remote patients. So for that, we, can, we are providing distributive justice to the patient. They don't have to come. We can prescribe medicines. They can get consultation from different places as well. So telemedicine can be used for teaching students also and providing them with a greater exposure from different institutions, we are also using telemedicine. But for treating patient, we need to provide autonomy to the patient and also maintain confidentiality for the, of the patient. That is on my part. Okay, thank you. Is there any more? Thank you, sir. Comments from the remote? 
Okay, if not, uh, I think uh, we will end our uh, session uh, for telemedicine education and research. So I hope you guys enjoy all the four presentations from the speakers. And please be uh, please give big round of applause to all the speakers.